Collects Chirping Crickets. This is Kim Takes On, and I'm Kim. Hi. And this is my co-host, Terrence the Wonder Duck. Terrence says hi and hopes you're all having a great day. So, before we get started with today's episode of Wackiness, um, I would like to say that uh, this episode is dealing with some very severe subject matter. Um, There are going to be talks about um, people unaliving themselves, people being unalived. It's going to get dark. Um, So trigger warning if that's something that freaks you out or upsets you. I mean, this is going to have my spin on it, so you know it's The subject matter might be serious, but don't expect me to be. Just heads up. So, what are we talking about today? Today, we are talking about a subgenre of music that had its day in the 50s, 60s, a little into the 70s, not much. What is known in certain circles under the name teenage tragedy songs, or as I like to call them, dead teenager songs. I warned you. These were songs that I think they kind of came about because people, you know, the whole idea that teenagers have this attitude of, oh, we're going to live forever and nothing's ever going to happen to us and stuff like that, which has basically been the attitude of teenagers since they've been teenagers, you know, the whole idea that you're young and the whole world stretching out in front of you and all that, and which is the way it should be. Teenagers should feel like, oh, you know, the world is ours and we can conquer it if we just go out there and try our best and do our thing and, you know, so on and so forth. I mean, that's great. You know, that's fantastic. That's how the world moves forward, you know. Um, But the thing is, these songs are kind of I think part of the reason these songs came about was because you, w- there's one thing that you find in a lot of these songs is motorcycles and people getting unalived while being on motorcycles. So I think the fact that the whole biker mentality really flourished in the 60s, it became part of the culture and stuff like that. And the whole idea of the, the cool motorcycle biker who, you know, risks death when they go out on the highway and they don't pay attention to anybody else, not even themselves, you know, and that kind of a thing. And that is where these, these songs started. Do I view these songs as kind of a warning to teenagers to, you know, take it easy and slow down a little bit? I don't know. I don't think they were intended that way, but who knows? I think more than anything else, they were intended to sell records. Although how some of these songs sold to anybody, I don't know. I'll be real honest and straight up because we've got, we've got all kinds of unaliving in this, in this uh, show this week. Um, I'm not going to go through every single song that qualifies under this genre. I'm just bringing up certain ones that caught my attention for whatever reason. But the very first song I could find that falls into this category is a song from 1955 called Black Denim Trousers and Motorcycle Boots. I hope that's not the only thing the person was wearing when they were riding the bike. Otherwise, that would look very strange. Uh, Which was uh, performed by the Cheers and the the person in the song uh, meets their end by colliding with a train on a motorcycle. Um, yeah, train versus motorcycle, always bet on the train. Actually, pretty much anything short of the train running into Superman or Godzilla, always bet on the train. Uh, the interesting thing about this song, although the person does have their unfortunate end by catching a train the hard way, um, their body is not found. They never found the, the, the person's remains. And I'm like, no, of course they didn't. They got smashed into a train. There's not going to be much left that's going to be in one piece. I mean, I wouldn't think. The next song that I want to bring up is um, a different song. and actually has... Um, 
it has a, a theme that you see in a lot of these uh, teen tragedy songs. The thing about these songs a lot of times is you have person A meets person B and they fall in love. And the issue is somebody's parents get all pissy about the whole thing. And then it's like, oh, we can't be together. Oh, no, what will we do? We'll die. And that's... So anybody out there who needed to read Romeo and Juliet for school, you're welcome. Um, I just cliff noted the heck out of it for you. And that's where we come up to with 1959's Running Bear, which was performed by Johnny Preston and was written, actually, by another person who's well-known to people who are followers of 50s music. Um, J.P. Richardson wrote this song. J.P. Richardson was better known to the world as the Big Bopper, the singer of Chantilly Lace, and also one of the men who was unfortunately killed in a real-life plane crash that took not only his life, but also the lives of Buddy Holly and Richie Valens, um, and also the people that were, you know, flying the plane and all that. Um, to say Running Bear is problematic is, putting it lightly, um, it is basically the same story pretty much as Romeo and Juliet. You have Running Bear and Little White Dove, who are members of two tribes that are that don't get along, so they can't get together and they wind up drowning together where they're trying to reach each other and stuff like that. So it's, you know, um, the song has, um, not aged well. Let's go with that. Um, I don't, th I mean, it's not done to be racist, I don't think, but it is kind of the, the Native American sounding chants in the background are not Native American, so I can understand why some people would view this as problematic. That makes sense to me. Um, next up, 1959's Teen Angel, which I've also heard as the name of a movie. I believe it was a rom-com with, you know, magical elements to it. Um, sung by Mark Denning. Um, I'm sorry, this one... The reason that this one is on here is because now I don't want to come off as an insensitive bitch. And I know sometimes I can be a little catty. No, there's no cats around here, Terrence. Don't panic. He gets itchy when somebody brings up cats. Um, because he's a duck. And he worries because he's a bird and ducks and birds. Ducks and cats don't always get along anyway. Um, but I can be a little harsh sometimes. But this song, I'm sorry... I get to the end of this song and I'm like, you idiot. The whole thing of the song is that this guy and this girl are out. And spoilers alert for the songs, by the way, if I didn't mention that before. Um, they're out on a date. Car gets stalled on a train track. Instead of train tracks. They get out of the car. She goes running back to the car because she's left his class ring in the car. Since the song is tall, called Teen Angel, I think you can figure out what happens from here. I don't really think I need to bring this up, but I'm going to anyway. Always bet on the train. Whew, really? You're never going to outrun a train! Unless your name is Barry Allen, you are not going to outrun the train! Crying out loud. Tell Laura I love her from 1960 is an interesting song in this genre to me uh performed by ray preston tell laura i love her is the story of a guy who enters a race so he can win the prize money to buy his girlfriend laura an engagement ring it doesn't work out so what makes this so interesting is the fact that this song actually has an answer song. Now, you all know what answer songs are, right? You're, you're a smart group. Terrence, aren't they smart? They're a smart bunch out there, right? They know what an answer song is. Do you think I should tell them anyway? 
Terrence wants to make sure people know what I'm talking about because he's a very conscientious duck that way. Um, an answer song, for those of you who don't know, is someone who writes a song in reply to someone else's song. Uh, a great example of that would be Sweet Home Alabama, which was um, Leonard Skinner's song, which was a reply to Neil Young's Southern Man. Um, they even mention that in the song, if you go look for it, if you go listen to Sweet Home Alabama. They mention that they hope Neil Young will remember a Southern man don't need him around anyhow, and so on and so forth. So that's an answer song. So this song, Tell Laura I Love Her, actually has an answer song. And it was performed in also 1960 by Marilyn McMichaels, and it was a song called Tell Johnny I Miss Him. And I don't know. I think that's kind of sweet. I just, I don't know. Maybe I'm just a squishmallow and I, I'm a little squishmallow inside. I just think that's kind of sweet. The idea that, that love can transcend, you know, the barrier of life and death. We'll get to that in a more literal sense later. Don't eat during that part coming up. I'll tell you for sure. Okay, now this song also came out in 1960, and this is one of the most WTF songs I have ever heard, ever. Now, up to this point, we've had a lot of people getting unalived, most of it involving, you know, people and motorcycles, people and cars, trains seeming to be the common denominator in a lot of this, or just people having accidents because, you know... Mechanical things in people sometimes don't mix really well. But the water was red from Johnny Symbol. Good Lord. Okay, this is a different one. This song is basically boy meets girl at the beach. Boy and girl fall in love. Ah, And they, you know, hang out at the beach all the time and they kiss and love each other on the beach and it's all just so sweet and wonderful and just light and fluffiness and all that until one night when they decide to go swimming at night and a white fin breaks through the water no i'm not kidding this song is a teen tragedy about a girl being killed in a shark attack lord i wish i was kidding but he winds up surviving because apparently the shark was only like, no, there's two people. No, I'm only, I'm only hungry enough for one. Om, nom, nom. And he brings what's left of her back up onto the beach. So she was his girlfriend. Now she's his chum. I hate myself. I am a horrible human being. Send your angry emails to PlatinumRoselle at Yahoo.com. No, I don't know what's wrong with me either. But the song doesn't end there. Oh, no. No, no, no. It doesn't end there. He goes back into the water because the shark is still apparently out in the water where he can see it at night. Because apparently he's swimming with night vision goggles on. Is this guy a Navy SEAL or what? Because he's going back out into the water with a knife to go get the shark. If you can find this song on YouTube, and you can if you go want to look it up, and I know you do, this is ridiculous. Other than the fact that this is, you know, 10 something, you know, 10 plus more years before Jaws comes out, and we're already demonizing sharks. And yes, I am a tree-hugging hippie before anybody decides to give me grief about it. You know, it's like, what? This is one of the most ridiculous teen tragedy songs I think I've ever heard. And believe me, it's going to get worse from here. Um, from 1961. Now, this one is just... This one's been done and done and done and done. I think I might have thrown in one more done than I needed to. Last Kiss, which was originally done in 1961 by Wayne Cochran and the CC Riders, and then done again in 1964 by J. Frank Wilson and the Cavaliers, which is the version 
that I knew. I used to hear it on the oldies station. I think that's the one they used to play. And then was released again in 1999 by Pearl Jam. Uh, apparently, it started out as a release only for their fan club, but somebody got a hold of it and played it on the radio, and it took off from there. And it's basically from the first-person perspective of a guy who was out with his girlfriend, and they get in an accident, and he makes it through the accident, although he's hurt because he mentions something warm in his eyes, and we're obviously supposed to assume that that's blood and he holds his girlfriend as she passes from this mortal coil and it's actually quite sad i mean a lot of these songs are schlocky the water was red is just so done so seriously that you wind up laughing because it's just so absurd but this this song actually made me feel sad and i know that tc is going to roll his eyes at this point um because <laughs> Because he's not the biggest Pearl Jam fan in the world. But I really felt Eddie Vedder, it, as a performance, I felt the pain that he was able to invoke in his voice as he's singing as this character. And I thought it was a really good cover myself. But I don't know. What do you guys think? Okay. Um, 1967 brings a song that is... We This is uncomfortable. This song is not a comfortable song. Dickie Lee and Patches. Now, Patches is another one of these, oh, our parents won't let us be together songs. Um, from Told from the, the point of view of the guy, uh, because Patches is apparently from the wrong side of the tracks. And this guy's parents are being jerks, and they're like, you can't date her because she's poor, blah, blah, blah. And she winds up unaliving herself. And then the end, of the, the end of the song is him saying, it may not be right, but I'll join you tonight. And I'm sitting there going, oh my gosh, this song is glorifying teen self-termination. What the hell? Of course, I'm sure people probably said the same thing about Romeo and Juliet when it first came out more they would they would have said it in a much more classy Englishy way because you know Shakespeare but I mean it's really like wow they actually got this song on the radio holy cow um okay this one is a little different and I wanted to include this because it's one of the few songs that I found that has a supernatural bent to it not the show, calm down. I'm not going to go into an hour rant about how Supernatural is one of the best shows on TV. And yes, I will fight you about that. No, no, no. This is a song from 1965 called Laurie, with in parentheses, Strange Things Happen, by Dickie Lee. There's that name again. And this is, well, for lack of a better word, it's a ghost story. And I'm not going to tell you anything about it. I'm going to be a jerk because it's actually a really interesting little ditty. Um, it's also got some connections with, I would say, urban myth or ghost stories or however you want to look at it. There is a ghost story from Chicago about a woman named Resurrection Mary that a lot of people have speculated that might have been where they got the idea for this song. And there's also the urban legend that's pretty much everywhere of the phantom hitchhiker. If you don't know what either of those things are, go look them up because it's really interesting. That stuff fascinates me. I like ghost stories and urban myths and spooky spooky stuff like that. It's just me. Um, but this is a really cool song. It's actually really well done and I like it a lot. Hopefully you'll go check it out. Um, okay, now obviously we have been talking about some very dire subjects here on the show this week, and it don't get much more dark than 1975's Run, Joey, Run uh, by David Geddes. Wow, is this song grim. Woo! Um, and obviously it's the 70s, so we've gotten beyond kind of more 
we're more into like in your face kind of stuff because it's the 70s. This song is, I mean, I got to the end of it and I was like, what the hell? Um, basically, the song is about a guy and a girl. She gets pregnant. Her dad flips the hell out, beats her up. When her boyfriend runs to try and get her to get her away from her father, who has a gun, stuff goes really friggin' sideways, and this guy winds up shooting and killing his pregnant daughter on accident because he was aiming for her, her boyfriend and she jumped in front of him. Wow. Wow. And the chorus is the girl pleading, Daddy, please don't. It wasn't his fault. He means so much to me. Daddy, please don't. We're going to get married. Just you wait and see. And when you hear that part at the end, oh my gosh, I was sitting there like, they didn't just do this in this song, did they? They actually did this. Holy crap. This song is bleak. I mean, bleak. It's good. It's an interesting song. And holy cow, does it hold your attention. But the first time I heard it, I was like, no, wait, what? What just happened? He did what? Son of a bitch. Wow. Song flipped me out. Uh, although I'm always like, it wasn't his fault. It wasn't his fault you got pregnant? Um, it was his, I'm not going to say it, Terrence, calm down. I'm, he worries that I'll say something that'll get us yanked off of YouTube. He's very, very conscientious like that. Okay. Now for every song out there, every genre of song out there, you're always going to have somebody that decides, Hey, I'm going to make this funny. I'm going to do a parody. And that's great. I mean, Weird Al Yankovic's made an entire career out of parodying songs well-deserved career because he's great and other people have done them too and that's always fun um another great example of one um leader of the pack which is another great teen tragedy song by the shangri-las i believe uh there's been a ver there was a version called leader of the laundromat that's basically you know taking the piss out of that song but there's parodies there's joking around and then there's this you remember a couple of weeks ago, um, hopefully you'll go back and listen to my stuff if you haven't listened to earlier things, where I talked about a song called Timothy and how Timothy was about cannibalism, pretty much, if you believe what the people who wrote it say, you know, <laughs> um, anyway, and you think, man, that is the craziest thing to write a song about. Well... Jimmy Cross says, hold my beer. <laughs> because in 1965, Jimmy Cross gave the world, I want my baby back. And no, this isn't a song about ribs from a restaurant. So stop it. Because I know somebody out there is doing it. So just quit it. No, no, no. I want my baby back is a song written from the POV of a guy whose girlfriend is killed in an, is in a motorcycle accident. It's very tragic and sad. And he can't live without her. I mean, he really can't live without her. I mean, really. So what this enterprising fellow decides to do is go to the cemetery, dig her up, get in the coffin with her, what's left of her, the pieces of her, and shut the lid, all the while singing, I got my baby back. It is very obvious from this song that what this person is intending to do to a corpse, or pieces of a corpse, is an act that is illegal in all 50 states and Canada and pretty much everywhere else you can possibly think of. Yes, this song is about something that starts with an N, ends with an A, and is gross AF. 
just if you're old enough to find it and your stomach can deal with the, what the mental images are, because believe me, they will pop up in your brain. Seek it out. I double dog dare you. Alrighty. So we've talked about pretty much everything we can think of except one, because I couldn't, I couldn't not do this show and not talk about one of my other favorite shows on television and actually now on the internet as well, Mystery Science Theater 3000. Now, I know some people out there are going, but Kim, what the hell does teen tragedy songs have to do with Mystery Science Theater 3000? I hear you. And it does, actually. There is something to talk about. And what to talk about is an episode from 1996. So that would have been um, the sci-fi time for Mystery Science Theater 3000 when they were on the Sci-Fi Channel, um, when they were showing a film called Werewolf. And um, it's a film about werewolves. Still a better love story than Twilight. Oh, I told myself I wasn't going to do that. Sorry. Um, there is a point during one of the host segments where Mike... Uh, Mike Nelson is dressed as a 50s teeny bopper girl named uh, Susie and Crow T. Robot and Tom Servo are dressed also as 50s girls, poodle skirts and the hair and everything like that. And Susie sings a song called Where Oh Werewolf, which is about the tribulations of having a boyfriend who is a werewolf. Still a better love story than twi- Ow! Damn it, Terrence, did you really have to kick me? Ouch. That hurt. Sorry. I was only told I can only do one Twilight bashing joke. You could have said that before you kicked me. Ouch. Um, it's a really funny segment. If you've never seen it, you should definitely go look for it. Um... Is Werewolf a good movie to have been mistied? Oh, hell yes. Oh, absolutely hell yes. Um, and it's just, you know, the usual craziness from the folks over at MST3K, which seemed like a perfect way to wrap up this little show. So, my crickets, if you have a teen tragedy song that you love, that you hate, or anything in between that I didn't mention, please send it along to me at PlatinumRoselle at Yahoo.com. Please uh, click on the like button for this video if you liked it. If you'd like to leave a comment, that would be awesome too. And please subscribe to our channel. And that will do it for another week here on Kim Takes On. I'm Kim. And this is still Terrence the Wonder Duck. And Terrence hopes you have a great week. And so do I. Bye-bye. Keep rocking and look out for those trains.